Welcome, thank you for coming out in this weather. Uh, but I'm sure it will be worth it. We're very excited about this panel. Uh, we couldn't be happier about our speakers. Uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Fabio Parasecoli, and I'm the coordinator of the Food Studies Program here at the New School. We started in 2008. Also, Andy was part of it since the very start, and even before the Food Studies Program was the Food Studies Program. Now we've developed a pretty large set of classes uh, about history, economics, sociology, media, communication, writing. Um, and interestingly, most of our classes are open to the general public. So if you're interested in anything, please sign up, uh, leave, our, uh, leave us your name, and we'll, be make, we'll make sure to, uh, to get in touch with you. We also develop um, a series of events this series started a few years ago. It still continues strong, uh, the culinary luminaries, but we have events that cover contemporary issues. Uh, we had an event about urban agriculture last uh, two weeks ago, actually, right before the storm. Uh, last but not least, we have a, a website called The Inquisitive Eater. Uh, where we accept submissions from anybody who wants to write about food, or wants to design about food, or wants to make photographs about food. Uh, but interestingly, for this events, we have a section where we put on all the uh, videos from the events. And actually, we're taping this event too, so uh, you'll be able to rewatch it or listen to it again. So I would like to introduce the moderator for tonight. Andy Smith is one of the columns of the program here. Uh, is a very well-known writer. Uh, among his last books is uh, American Tuna, and is working on a couple of other encyclopedias. As usual, he's got, what, 20, 25 books out. So he's a pretty powerful voice uh, in, the, in the world of food, and uh, we're very lucky to have him here at the New School. So Andy will take care of introducing all the speakers. Thank you again for coming out. Thank, thank you, Fabio. I, I want you to know we very carefully selected this date. We knew that the election would be held yesterday, that some of you would be celebrating, some of you would not. And most people would be sleeping in in the afternoon. We planned on a, a, a major hurricane to hit last week <laughs> so that we could have no communications for uh, nine days. Um, and uh, of course, we knew that the Nor'easter was coming today. So these are very carefully thought out things on our schedule. So I just want you to know, we only wanted those who were really interested and were committed uh, to make it here uh, t uh, tonight. So this is something that we've done uh, very well. Now the good news is we will be taping the session um, and we will be, uh, it'll be up on the website for the new school in about a week. Uh, and um, the reason why I mention that is we do want questions at the end. We want comments. Uh, in the past, many of the culinary luminaries, we've had people who actually knew uh, the, the person we were um, talking about. Uh, and if you've had any experiences with Henri Soleil or had uh, dined at his restaurant, um, that would be uh, wonderful to talk about. Um, and I know that so many bright students are out there. You have so many questions that you're ready to ask. Uh, so um, we look forward to your comments and your, and your questions. Uh, every time I read anything about the life of Henri Soleil, I am absolutely fascinated by it. Uh, and um, here, is, here is a man who is the maitre d' at a restaurant, the French uh, pavilion at the New York World's Fair in 1939. Uh, he uh, will stay there uh, uh, until 1940. By the time the fair closes, uh, France will be occupied by German army. Uh, he can't, uh, chooses not to go home. Uh, and uh, in the midst of this, he opens up a restaurant on October 15th, 1941. And for those of you who know history, uh, this is seven weeks before um, December 7th, 1941, and the United States enters World War II. So here it is. He has a haute cuisine restaurant in America at that time 
which was extremely unusual simply because of um, prior to that time, haute cuisine had largely disappeared in New York City, first due to World War I and the restrictions that were uh, there for alcoholic beverages. Then you immediately had prohibition. Uh, most of the haute cuisine restaurants that were around at that time disappeared. And then you had the Depression. So you had all sorts of things that hit just before this. And here's somebody um, who's, who's really not that adverse and not that knowledgeable about America opening up a small restaurant. Uh, and it survives during World War II, which was a miracle in itself. And then, of course, for the next 20 years after, after World War II, was one of the preeminent restaurants in New York. Uh, and as our panelists will talk, um, they will be the ones, um, that will be the restaurant that will really launch um, the uh, haute cuisine restaurants uh, here. And it has a tremendous influence um, on American culinary history. So we have three wonderful speakers. We've given you their biographies. If, uh, have we not? Pam, we gave them biographies. Um, and um, so I, I'm not going to go through all of their accomplishments, uh, but I do want to introduce them very quickly. At the far end is Priscilla Parker's Ferguson. Uh, her wonderful book is Accounting for Taste, the Triumph of French uh, Cuisine. She will be talking about French cuisine in general and setting a context for Henri Soleil. Uh, the second speaker will be William Grimes. Does that name ring a bell with anybody in here? Is this some, some, some of you have heard of him. This is, this is wonderful. His book is Appetite City, A Culinary History of New York, which is fantastic. Um, for the new, those of us on cable, I don't know if you have seen his programs, also titled uh, Appetite City. They're on the web, um, and um, you can see them on that as well. I thought they were just fantastic. Uh, our third, uh, and he will be talking directly about Henri Soleil in the context of New York. Our third uh, speaker, uh, will be Arian Batterberry, who is the co-founder of, fine, of uh, uh, Food and Wine and the co-founder of uh, Food Arts and the co-author of a wonderful uh, history book on the town in New York, The Landmark History of Eating, Drinking, and Entertainments from the American Revolution to the Food Revolution by, uh, by herself and her uh, husband. So uh, there are all three wonderful books. Um, and we were supposed to be selling them, but I assume that they didn't make it here. All right, it's a minor problem. Uh, we can blame um, we can blame Sandy for that. All right, uh, I, I just had one other uh, comment to make, and I'll turn it over to our speakers. Uh, when uh, Henri Soleil died in 1966, uh, it was Craig Claiborne who eulogized him in the New York Times, and his comment was um, Henri Soleil was the Michelangelo, the Mozart, the Leonardo of French restaurants in America. And with that, uh, we will turn it over to Priscilla Parkers Ferguson. Andy took my first line because I was going to quote that Michelangelo, Mozart, and Leonardo. That's a lot to uh, live up. He wasn't a celebrity chef. We have celebrity chefs all over the place now. He was not a celebrity chef. He wasn't even a chef. He was a celebrity. And his restaurant, the Pavillon, was the sort of sanctum, sanctorum, the place to see and especially to be seen. And I think we'll hear more about that um, uh, later. Uh, by the New York that counted. Now, I wasn't among the New Yorkers that counted, uh, but I think I went to the Pavillon. I'm not sure I went to the Pavillon. Late in its career, early in uh, mine, I was a graduate student. He was only two years old. Right. <laughs> I was a graduate student uh, uptown, and uh, in such days when graduate students could afford treats like this. But I don't remember the place, and I don't remember the food, and that's a bad sign, because I normally have a very good food memory. So I took the drastic step of contacting my ex-husband to find out if, in fact, we went. And he said, oh, yes, enthusiastic. But then he, told, then he described a meal that was another meal in France, and he described, in fact, the wrong meal there as well. So he had misidentified the meal that he did remember. Um, and so his memory was no better than mine. Still, it doesn't make any difference whether I actually ate at uh, the Pavillon, because like so many of us, uh, whether we know it or not, and probably often we don't know it, uh, I've dined off the legend of this restaurant a good many times. Better yet, like many New Yorkers, I have dined, I guess I call it, from Le Pavillon um, at lots of other places because I was just talking to one of my students uh, today 
um, somewhat older student. He said, ah, yes, well, you have your own, just people, restaurants all over New York for many years. Um, members of the staff, trained by Henri Soule, translated haute cuisine, French haute cuisine, into American terms. Uh, so Pierre Freinet and Jacques Pépin, both of whom uh, later worked for that temple of haute cuisine, Howard Johnson's. Um, and then Freinet uh, had uh, his culinary partnership with Craig Claiborne, uh, led to cookbooks, columns, led to, then later through the restaurant, La Caravelle, opened in 1960 by staff from the Pavillon. Another trail leads from La Caravelle to the White House. Uh, the Kennedys were big uh, fans, big customers at La Caravelle, whose chef from Le Pavillon, Robert Fasseguet, trained René Verdun, who uh, uh, in time became uh, a White House chef under uh, JFK. Then in restaurants, such as Union Square Cafe, whose original and indeed current chef, Michael Romano, also trained at La Caravelle. But translation is indeed the right word. The world of Le Pavillon was the world of high society, the world of power lunches and glamorous dinners, a world of haute cuisine pervaded by imperious waiters uh, and an even more imperious maître d'hôtel, Henri Soule. In the 40s, 50s, and 60s, that's what French restaurants, unless they were bistros in, uh, on the west side in the 40s, um, uh, were, were thought to be and they were expected to be. Soule was in many ways French cuisine personified. Um, foreign, difficult, extravagant, expensive, though the prefix dinner when La Caravelle opened in 1960 was $7.50. Wine was extra, but still, but that explained why graduate students like me could splurge. By all accounts, Soule was imperial and imperious, authoritative and authoritarian, dutiful, uh, dutifully obeying the high, the mighty, and especially the wealthy. Tales circulated of Le Pavillon banning ordinary mortals to Siberia. There was some discussion before. Um, uh, among the panel, did he invent Siberia? Well, if he didn't invent it, he should have invented because it, it fits very well with him. That is to say, a table by the kitchen or on the way to the toilet or next to a drafty door. Uh, Joseph Kennedy eventually deserted Le Pavillon because, uh, for La Caravelle, because at least one story has it that Soule expressed doubts that John Kennedy would win the presidency and he did it in rather less than temperate terms. Um, such was, in many ways, the, for good and for ill, the world of French cuisine for most Americans. Rarified cooking for a rarefied clientele, heavy on the sauces of classic French style, and woe to anyone who did not know those classics, who couldn't read the menu, who didn't know menu French. Menu French and French French are two different things. But if you didn't know menu French, if you didn't know what a sauce bernage was, and you had to ask, well, you know, that's putting you in a feeling of, of inferiority. Because the snooty French waiter, uh, and French waiters were obligated to be uh, snooty in a way, uh, put ignorant guests in their place. The waiter, not the guest, ran the meal. It helped for my comfort level that I'd lived in Paris for two years, I'd taken cooking lessons, and I'd eaten around a lot. I knew menu French, and I could, if need be, out-snoot the waiter, although I don't think I quite ever dared. The intimidation factor is high, or was high, for this French, uh, French cuisine. Uh, who wouldn't be intimidated by the evident culinary knowledge and by the waiter's heavy accent? Um, the accent conveyed authenticity. I mean, it's got to be French cuisine, got a really heavy French accent. Um, to be sure, but the greater the authentic Frenchness, the more foreign the experience, and um, the more intimidating. And given the international prestige of French cuisine, foreign meant superior. Which, and I could say even this, for many years I taught uh, French language and literature, and there was always a sense that, ah, uh, well, French was a different foreign language than others. It represented high class, it was art, uh, and, uh, uh, and, um, and so on. 
uh, one of my colleagues from uh, what he called the other side of the track said, well, he went into French literature because it was a way of getting across the tracks. Well, French cuisine uh, partook of that. Uh, and so this puts the diner in a feeling of uh, sort of inferiority, which is not exactly the great prescription for culinary pleasure. Le Pavillon closed, we'll hear, Le Caravelle in 2004, the same year Lutece's chef restaurateur André Soltner moved to the French Culinary Institute, which is now the International Culinary Center. Times have changed. Café society is no more. In its stead, a more mobile, more motley crew, a more adventure, culinarily adventurous crew as well. Dress codes have given way to fashion extravagance or just plain, plain. I mean, there are t-shirts in three-star restaurants at least at noon. I did ask in one restaurant, what happens at night if someone comes in without a jacket? And he said, well, we give them a jacket. He said, what if they refuse to wear it? And he said, well, we put the jacket on the uh, back of the chair. Uh, so the jacket is there for the form of it all. But, you know, informalization is really what um, characterizes dining out now. Waiters ask, how are you doing? And are you still working on that? Uh, snoot is out, oat is out, but once, uh, and not all that long ago, it was very, very, very in. All right, thank you. Our second speaker is William Grimes, New York Times, Appetite City. Um, well, I can just speak from here. Am I projecting? Can you all hear me? It'll be turned on shortly. And uh, I, uh, I want to give a sense. We've gotten a little bit of a, a whiff of Henri Soule, the man. I want to try to see if I can fill out the portrait just a little bit. He uh, visually, he was one of these, uh, he was about five foot five, and he was, looked about as wide as he was tall. He was moon-faced, pudgy little fellow, uh, but which makes him sound like a rather dismissible and insignificant specimen of humanity, but he was quite the opposite. He was a towering figure. And his shadow, we live in his shadow even today, uh, although I have to say we're at the absolute end of the twilight period of of the uh, of what might be called the Pavillon period in New York, I just a few weeks ago I wrote an obituary of a uh, restaurant owner by the name of Robert Trebou who owned a restaurant called Le Vaudor up by Bloomingdale's on 61st. And I volunteered to do that obituary even though I was no longer in that department of the paper because I knew that I was the only one in the building who would recognize the connection between Robert Trebou and Le Pavillon. He was a waiter at uh, at Le Pavillon way back in the 50s. And he's one of the many, many, many people who graduated from this finishing school of the culinary arts. And there uh, is um, uh, there's one restaurant remaining, Le Grand Oui, which is the uh, sort of the last of the Mohicans, to use a totally non-French comparison, that uh, the Charles Masson, the father of the owner of the present restaurant, came over in 1939 on the Normandy with the other hundred or so team members who created this, what was really France's greatest gift to the United States since the Statue of Liberty, and I'm dead serious about that. It was, uh, it was part of the French government pavilion at the 1939 World's Fair. And Soule, uh, and I'm gonna backtrack to explain how he got to this position, was selected to be the, the guy who was, ran the restaurant and presented French cuisine to an America that was starved for fine dining and had known fine dining in previous generations in a spectacular fashion. Um, up to Prohibition and the, I would say up to the First World War, then Prohibition, then the Depression, there was a glamorous, glorious era of New York dining around the turn of the last century, centered around Times Square, that was uh, like nothing the city had seen before and has not seen since. After this long period of deprivation and drought and uh, a culinary wasteland really in New York, the fair, which is not intended to be a culinary event at all, turned out to be one because every national pavilion, every national exhibition center at the fair and was determined to put on, uh, put, to put on a show and that show included a restaurant in France, of course, 
move right to the head of the line. They were determined that uh, for all the chaos that defined France in the 1930s, if you think about it, it was just um, politically, it was one of the great messes of the modern age. Yet, they were able to put together this fabulous exhibition center pavilion and to assemble the top culinary talent in France, put them together, put them on a boat, send them over to New York and get a restaurant up and running. It just became the sensation uh, for the whole time that it was operating. The man who made the train run on time and presented Fran French food as it should be made to Americans who needed to be re-educated, New Yorkers who needed to be reminded of something they had once possessed, uh, this was Henri Soulet. Now, who was this fellow? He was born around 1903, in 1903, near Biarritz. His father was a building contractor, and he went up to the ranks of the profession in the old-fashioned way. He started out as a busboy at a resort hotel in Biarritz, and uh, his town was near Bayonne. I think I misspoke there. Uh, but he had a cousin who worked in the hotel in Biarritz, got a job as a busboy, then went to Paris, started working his way at various top drawer restaurants as waiter, and then by the age of 23, and I'll repeat that, 23, he was captain at the Hotel Mirabeau. Now, France is not a culture in which one rose quickly in any department of life. It was a very slow, gradual process, and until the very recent past, was, it was still in restaurants especially so. You did not aspire to do anything except scrub pots and pans for several years before you were allowed to touch a utensil. It's almost Japanese in that way. You know, you, you don't get e even to touch rice for nine years as you appren apprentice your way. But he rose very quickly. And as fate would have it, he was at a restaurant that was run by, that was owned by one of the big shots in Paris at the time. And he was tapped to organize this effort for the uh, 1939 World's Fair, he solicited Soule, who knew some English. He had worked, in, in fact, in London for a little while at a restaurant called the Trocadero, just to improve his English. And uh, by the way, there he started out as a busboy. He allowed himself to be busted down to busboy, and then became captain in no time at all, within the year that he was there at the Trocadero which gives you a sense of, of what the talent was. This is a man, by the way, who once said that his hobby was paying his bills promptly. <laughs> so, uh, rigor, discipline, absolute command of, of the talents required to be a restaurateur. And he defined them in an, a famous series of profiles in The New Yorker by a writer by the name of Joseph Wexberg, who often wrote on culinary matters. It later became a book called Dining at the Pavillon. And he said the perfect restaurateur, I had to bring my little cheat sheet here. The perfect restaurateur is essentially a diplomat. Of course, he is also an actor, a stage manager, a lawyer, magician, a mediator. Above all, he would have to be an accomplished mind reader. He must know how to talk to people. No two people must be treated alike. He flatters them, he subtly educates them, and occasionally he asserts his authority. I think you get a flavor of the man from the you know, the precise calibration of those remarks. Very well said, très bien dit. And uh, he uh, was stranded by the war, which stranded him and his, the whole team. And his resolution was, with a modest amount of capital, he had, had savings and he had a couple of backers and he had a lot of connections that he made while he was running the show at the New York World's Fair. He opened, uh, the aptly named Pavillon. The restaurant at the fair, by the way, was just called the Restaurant Francais. He opened it in Manhattan in 1941 and uh, to instant acclaim. And the rest, uh, the rest, as they say, is history. I was reminded at the very last minute, I was reminded that uh, among the many, many graduates of this fabulous school of French cuisine was Jacques Pepin, who came in 1959 and was hired by Pierre Franet. And he, he's written, um, I don't know if you've probably, all everybody here has read The Apprentice, which he wrote. I think it's one of the best books, not only about French food, but about France that's ever been written. I, I am a complete admirer of that little book which is beautifully written, and uh, I don't know whether he just has natural talent or a great editor. Whatever it is, 
it's a pleasure from beginning to end. But he reminds us of what the cooking was like uh, at Le Pavillon. It was classic French cuisine. Uh, and there would always be a, um, there was a rotating series of daily specials that were sort of uh, bistro level dishes, which is what Soule himself liked to eat um, a lot. I mean, th these were the sentimental favorites that you would find in French bistros all the time. And, uh, but one of their signature dishes, they, one was uh, a mousseline of sole that took four hours to make and you had to order 24 hours in advance. But another famous one was the, the poulet uh, pavillon which Pepin describes actually pretty lusciously, I think, when he, uh, he describes it as being a harmonious, rich, glistening roast chicken. We flavored the chicken simply with thyme, salt, and pepper. Now, when you think about classic French cuisine, you, you know, this is as revised by Escoffier, you, you think of complexities that exist in our minds but not, was not in the food necessarily. We flavored the chicken simply with thyme, salt, and pepper, and roasted on a high heat, basting regularly to give it a deep brown, crisp finish. Then we made a sauce of reduced chicken stock, champagne, and cream, finishing it with cognac, and drizzled the reduced natural juices over the sauced bird, period. Classical dishes like these were much less complicated and more straightforward than the overwrought food often served in restaurants today, even those that are falsely labeled country or simple. So, it was, a, it was a temple that was, where the religion was uh, high standards, uh, good ingredients, very talented chefs, and one god, Henri Soule. He decided what people did, and he kept them anonymous. There were no celebrity chefs at Le Pavillon. Pierre Frané became a celebrity after he left, but the idea of a restaurant at the time and, and Le Pavillon's in part responsible for defining uh, what we think of as a restaurant or fine dining in the United States. The chef was an anonymous toiler, like someone you would hire to, uh, to put the wallpaper up in your apartment. He would never be seen, his name would never be known. The name that you knew, the face that you saw, was Henri Soule. He is the man, and when he died in 1966, it truly was the end of an era. The restaurant survived for another until 1971, but it was not the same restaurant. And I have to say, it's very doubtful we'll ever see its like again. And that is part of the reason why we're celebrating this, this great man with the unprepossessing appearance. Thank you. Our third speaker is Ariane Batterberry. A co founder of Food Arts Magazine, co author of On the Town in New York. Uh, well, I'm going to try to explain how we got from there to here. One thing I'm going to start by saying, which, and which I'll explain later, is that looking around at you, I would say that very few of you have ever, re ever had the opportunity to taste really great French haute cuisine, and that's not because of anything other than the fact that you all seem to be under 70. <laughs> and, um, um, and I'll explain later why I said that. In any case, the era of Le Pavillon was an era of great French restaurants in New York, and there were quite a number of them. There was... Um, uh, the Colony, which is where um, Sirio Maccione was at age 21 or 22, a very handsome head waiter. And uh, there was the Boisin, there was um, uh, um, um, various others. There was um, also, there were the great uh, nightclubs such as the Stork Club in El Morocco, where the food. Is that? Do you hear me better now? No, the other one was better. Yeah, the other one was a lot better. <laughs> Evidently, it's a problem. It's a problem with the uh, filming on it. So I'm sorry about that. Oh, I see. I see. Well, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, there was Cafe Chauvron. They all had superb. French chefs, 
and they all died at more or less the same time. Of course, the pavillon was never the same after Soule died, and it, it went on for another five years, but that was all. And there were various um, reasons that they all died at, at, in the early 70s. For one thing, the city of New York was going into a sort of uh, a doldrums and uh, real estate prices were down and everything was, was um, there was not a lot of prosperity during the 70s. But there were several really basic reasons all these restaurants expired at the same time. One of them was labor problems. Suddenly there were things were unionized. It wasn't like it was in the old days in France where you had a lot of, of um, people who were doing stages and they were paid nothing and they were basically slaves. That could translate to the United States but not once the, not, uh, uh, once the 1960s set in and certainly not in the 70s. Uh, there was uh, another uh, problem in that um, uh, no skilled, there was a change in laws and you couldn't get into this country as a skilled worker the way you used to be able to. These laws were changed in the late 60s, early 70s so that it was very difficult to get French chefs into the country, but also there, and there was another problem, which is to say suddenly there was a, a lot of construction in New York and the charming little old streets where uh, a restaurant could find a fairly low rent, those were disappearing with more and more uh, skyscrapers. But the real problem is also that all of these restaurants had undergone a life cycle. And uh, just as Soule died and not young, a lot of the moving spirits behind them were either retiring or expiring. There were different reasons. For example, the colony closed because of the unions, but the Café Chauvron closed because the building was torn down. Somehow everything came to an end. Well, you may want to know how we got from there to here, this amazing explosion of creativity. And that, there are several reasons that there were huge, huge changes that happened in the 70s. The first was the counterculture of the 60s. I know this sounds strange, but um, I'm old enough to remember very clearly. The idea of working with your hands was something that you, you hoped your, your children, if that's the way you earned a living, you hoped your children wouldn't have to. They would go to college and they would go on to more intellectual pursuits. And suddenly, with the counterculture, everybody was going back to doing things with their hands. And so there were a lot of young people who wanted to be in the kitchen creating food uh, who were not didn't see themselves as having a future as domestic servants. They saw themselves as having a future as artisans creating something. So the whole artisan movement started in the 60s and it changed the attitude towards uh, producing food. Uh, then um, there was another very important development, which is women were now suddenly not in the kitchen anymore. In huge numbers, women were joining the workforce, not looking after the children, not preparing a, you know, a meal for the whole family, not devoting their whole day to, pr to cooking for the family. So suddenly there was a whole lot of going out to eat. Um, the parents treating themselves once or twice a week to a good restaurant, right down to people going uh, to uh, taking the whole family for a pizza. But uh, the fact that women weren't in the kitchen anymore gave a great spur to the restaurant industry. Uh, also, it may interest you or amuse you to know that it was in 1977 that the, the uh, government ceased to, to categorize um, chefs as domestic servants. It wasn't until 1977 that that happened, believe it or not. And um, uh, then there was this huge change, a huge change that happened in the end of the 70s called Nouvelle Cuisine. And it's because of Nouvelle Cuisine that I'm saying that probably none of you have really tasted 
the old great French haute cuisine. And Nouvelle Cuisine was a huge revolution in fine, in fine cuisine. Suddenly, vegetables were cooked much less. There was a whole lot of, of um, uh, the level of, uh, or um, to which uh, vegetables, fish, and so on were cooked uh, was uh, changed totally. A lot of what we used to have in, uh, in haute cuisine, you would all call overcooked. You know, vegetables were not supposed to be crunchy. Well, suddenly they were. Sauces were not supposed to be loaded with cream anymore. Suddenly it was the essence of uh, a, a reduced essence of the meat that you were eating and with very little to, to thicken it out. And everything was everything was lighter. Portions were much, uh, uh, much smaller, and beautiful plates were arranged. Even in the great haute cuisine restaurants, as I remember when I was a child, the, you had the meat was in the middle, and there was a vegetable, and there was a vegetable on a little plate on the side, and you didn't have these extraordinary constructions that you do now. So there was this huge revolution, and um, it. It, uh, oh, also there was the bicentennial, so there was a lot of attention paid to New York. And this revolution um, was best expressed in something um, that actually I myself was involved with. We founded Food and Wine magazine in 1978. And in 1979, we had the first anniversary and we had a big party and um, uh, we were working with people who suggested it wasn't our idea uh, that the theme of our party be something called Jeune Gastronomie, the young chefs. And um, we had, we f flew over um, uh, two delightful chef, young chefs from France and one from Italy. But we also brought, because we had been told that extraordinary things were going on, we brought a, a chef called Paul Prudhomme from New Orleans where he was famous but he was not known anywhere else and he was doing extraordinary new things. And we also flew in a lovely young girl from California named Alice Waters. And Paul Prudhomme served a meal with things that nobody had ever had. Uh, I remember there was a, a, a sausage of shellfish. Nobody had a shellfish sausage before. And then there was pla blackened redfish. Well, blackened, you didn't blacken something. That was a totally new idea, and certainly you didn't blacken redfish. And then there was a... Uh, um, there was veal in a, in a fish sauce, or rather, I think, rather, I'm afraid, fish in a veal sauce, but in any case, there was a mixture of that sort. And um, dessert was a, um, a um, what was called a Cajun cabin, which was a little box, a little house made of, of chocolate filled with uh, Louisiana strawberries and a hot strawberry sauce was poured on top which um, uh, made the houses melt and the nasty humor of the time, the press called it, you know, uh, making a little Vietnam. So <laughs> that was the, uh, uh, but this was all the kind of food nobody would had. And then Alice Waters, was grilling her baby lamb from California, and everything she brought was from California, and it was all great cuisine, but who thought of great cuisine or great ingredients coming from California? Unusual ingredients, you guess a tomato or an orange, but not. Uh, she brought uh, garlic, and she roasted a whole head of garlic. Well, nobody in New York, God knows, had ever eaten a whole head of garlic. And the, the lamb, as I said, which was grilled in the middle of Central Park, which was illegal, but she had to be out in the open in nature because that was Alice. So we had this weird little girl, which she was. She was in her 20s with long hair, sort of in the middle of the park, and the police were standing there in horror, and she's cooking her lamb, and it's her return to nature. 
So all of that happened in 1979. And what was most amazing was, well, we had the press uh, to this event. And th the New York press had never tasted food created by a great American chef. Up to that day, literally that day, there a, a great chef was by definition French or possibly Italian, but absolutely not American. <laughs> and after that, there, the combination of the recognition, and it got huge recognition in the press. And as it happened, uh, the Washington Post was having just that week their very first food section, and the whole front page of that food section was about the American chefs that had, had uh, cooked at our lunch. And it wasn't about us at all. We meant this for PR. It was no PR for food and wine at all. But it was great PR for the chefs who uh, suddenly were uh, famous. And that's another thing that happened at this very period, which is there was a uh, young woman in France named Yannou Collard who was doing public relations and she was in, asked by Paul Bocuse, who was an unknown young French chef then, um, to do some p public relations for him. And he told her something that was very moving to me. He said that um, uh, when he was a young apprentice, the, every night when he went home, he saw the, the chef he worked for drinking himself into oblivion falling asleep on top of the day's accounts, which he would sit in. And he said he didn't want that to be his life. And so he hired this bright young girl, a French girl from Poland, actually, who and he said, can you do something for me? And she conceived, literally conceived, then and there, of the idea of the star chef. And she said, well, you know, they put movie stars on television, on the radio. Maybe I could get some of these interviewers to talk about you. And the interviewers were suddenly said, well, a chef, why not? Everybody's, you know, already heard about so-and-so uh, from the films, Jean-Louis Trétignan. We've interviewed him 10 times. OK, we'll interview this young chef. And suddenly it became a thing, and it became a thing, and he appeared on television. Well, he was very attractive then and young, and it was interesting. Nobody had ever seen a chef on television. Then the whole, she came to the United States with Le Nôtre and started doing the same sort of promotions here, and suddenly you had the whole concept of the star chef. So all of that happened all at the same time, and all after the death of these great French haute cuisine restaurants. So the 70s was the period when the, uh, the death of the old and the birth of the new. And Soule really represented the old and what was great of the old. But if you want to know how we got from there to here, that's how we did it. I have a thousand questions, uh, but I really do want to give the opportunity for the audience to either make statements or have questions, but I have a couple questions which I need to ask. Where is French food headed in New York today? Do we have any comments at all? Oh, it's headed in lots and lots of different uh, directions, and most of which are not really called French food. Um, they're... I mean, you take someone like Jean-Georges Van Gericht and it's Asian fusion, but then his own particular take on it. It's the era of what I call culinary individualism. Every, it's sort of every chef on his own. When I first came back to New York, um, uh, now 20 years ago, I joined a colleague and interviewed a lot of chefs, including a number of French chefs, and I was interested to ask the French chefs, well, what's French cuisine for you? Uh, what do you, what's it mean to you? You're in New York, you have uh, customers, or Americans are your customers, Americans are in the kitchen, Americans are your product. And they, many, all of them that I interviewed from Daniel Boulier to Von Gericht and then others said, well, it's, it's a, a, a continuing a certain idea of France. 
And I think that is continued to a certain extent, but mostly it's, it's the sense of adventure is, is exploding, more so than in France. Uh, and you, and you, I don't think you really call it French cuisine anymore. Yeah, one of the shocking developments of the last 20 years has been the total, um, I don't know what you call it, collapse may be too dramatic, but France from, if you were to draw a world culinary map, France would take up 90% of it 25 years ago, and now maybe it's 5%. It's just shrunk in importance, and I think even to the French themselves, this is true of French culture in general, but in, and even to French, you know, this model of the fine dining French restaurant doesn't even have a lot of validity in France anymore. I think younger chefs are more taken with the idea of what David Chang does at the little tiny place in a remote corner of Paris where there are six tables and you don't even want Michelin to know that you exist. Uh, that's just a radical revision of the rules and the, uh, the globalization that was certainly influencing people like Jean-Georges Van Gerich, who's fairly, you know, he, he's of some age at this point. But the, he was a young Turk when I first interviewed him. Right, but that kind of Asianization of French food yeah. that he did brilliantly just became the norm because for right. all these French chefs were traveling internationally and picking up influences. You could get ingredients from all over the globe delivered in 24 hours. That has just created this total melting pot and uh, a valorization of street food and food served from stalls versus this pavillon kind of restaurant. It's fortunate that Henri Soule didn't live long enough to be with us because he would just be, no. you know, someone said it in another context, spinning in his grave so fast he would drill a hole halfway to China. So <laughs> it was, uh, you know, it's just the world is turned upside down as far as that's concerned. Erin? Well, you know, food history is one long evolution. It never stays in one place ever. And probably French haute cuisine was, how can I say, the longest lasting of all the developments in food history because you could sort of date it from Louis, Louis the 15th probably. Uh, so you're dating it from the early 18th century and it was all powerful until the last 20 years. So um, you're speaking of something um, that was around for a long time, but if you look at the total history of food, there are always going to be changes. I think that um, there have been some major changes in France itself, such as we've just been hearing. Um, uh, another, there are two more that I would mention. One is that the old French great haute cuisine restaurant emanated from the French family restaurant, the mom pop restaurants that were, when I was young, all over France, and they were marvelous. They were marvelous. And usually there was the daddy in the kitchen and the mother out front, never the reverse, I have to say. And uh, they, it's from those kinds of restaurants that the old haute cuisine restaurants developed because the, the husband might be more ambitious, uh, he might attract more people, the restaurant would expand, his cuisine would become more, um, more haute cuisine as opposed to, as opposed to just um, cuisine bourgeois, there was always that division. And then maybe the grandson would even try to expand it further and you'd have uh, one of the great, um, great French restaurants, virtually all of them had originated in some generation as a mom and pop restaurant. Well, there are no more mom and pop restaurants in France anymore, uh, and very, very few, and the reason is the children of mom and pop didn't want to work round the clock the way their parents did, and certainly the grandchildren didn't. And then, worst of all, a lot of sort of food service foods suddenly were available so you could get a canal of pike in sort of frozen that you would squeeze out. I mean, it was just, so this became a temptation. And the result was that, that there, and also I should add, the government didn't help by uh, taxing, uh, they taxed French restaurants in a very unfair way and very foolishly. 
and I don't know the details except I knew them at one point. But the government did not help. Uh, the socialist government sort of saw um, oak cuisine as um, something that, um, that a good socialist government should put an end to. So, I mean, you know, they didn't have any proper vision. And so there were a lot of things affecting cuisine in France. Still, you could get a very good meal there, but in the old days, it was anywhere. Now you have to know where to go. And uh, as both, as everybody else this evening has said, globalization. And well, don't forget, France is now part of a larger Europe as well. And so there, there's that sort of uh, countervailing thing going on. And uh, it's affected things like artisanal cheeses because there are all sorts of laws now that make it very difficult to do artisanal things anywhere in Europe. Very stupid laws that, I mean, I could go on all night. <laughs> but um, a lot, there have been just huge, huge changes. And I think that um, we have to regard French cuisine in a way, the way if you were an architect, you would regard the great buildings of ancient Greece, the foundation on which everything else developed. But now there's a whole lot of other things going on. There's a film that uh, came out, uh, I saw it about a month ago, called Step Up to the Plate. Uh, it's about the um, a father, Michel Lebrun, who has a three-star, Michelin three-star restaurant in southern France, and uh, giving over the restaurant to his son, and exactly how that changed in generations. And it's not, they're not serving haute cuisine, it's very much, you know, foraging, it's the connections to the land, they moved, they go to Japan, so you, there's an ideal of cuisine that's haute, but it's not haute cuisine at all in that sense, but there is that ideal in certain places. There's also another film um, that uh, just came out called um, uh, Three Stars. Um, it's a German documentary, it was playing at the quad, so it's right in the neighborhood, it was anyway. Um, and interviewing uh, mostly three-star chefs uh, around the world, only one woman. Um, and one who had given up his third star, or rather he closed the restaurant and opened another one because of the, the incredible investment of time, uh, money, uncertainty. You know, how does one keep that kind of restaurant going? It's incredibly expensive and in terms of just resources, but also human resources on that. It's an, it's an amazing investment. Very interesting film for anyone who's um, concerned with what's going to happen to cuisine that's oat, but it's not, certainly not oat cuisine. I well, want to open it up for questions or comments, but you have to go up to the microphone or you have to get a micro, the microphone will be delivered to you. So uh, if you can. Thank you. Uh, it's okay. Uh, my question is for uh, Ms. Battenberry. Do you think what you were just describing about the situation in France might have something to do with the reason that there are lots of young French chefs or beginning chefs who are arriving, they're going straight to Brooklyn, they're going to Smith Street, they're ending up in non-central non, uh, neighborhoods and they're hanging out their shingles? Oh, absolutely, because France be continues to, to, to nurture young people as chefs, and the concept of being a chef is something that a lot of, of French young people have in inherited, just as the concept of being a ballerina, if you were in Russia, all during communism, there was always this concept of being a ballerina, so Russia kept producing wonderful ballet dancers and ballerinas and they ended up in all over the world. Well, it's the same um, in France. And I think also, especially the last few years, uh, that um, there have been all these problems in, in, the, uh, com you know, in the EU. Uh, and it's been, for the last 10 years, restaurants in France have just not been doing well which means a lot of the children of these people who want to be in restaurants and they want to be chefs feel they have to emigrate. Or they want to emigrate. They want to see the world. They want to be 
part of, of the bigger picture, really. So I'm, that's absolutely true. Other questions, comments? This group is silent. I cannot believe that. Okay, yeah. One, one second. Oh. Do they in France, do they also have celebrity chefs the way we do in oh, sure. uh, New York on television? Oh, yeah. Oh. Mm -hmm. They do, like a Rachel Ray would oh. be. Well, they don't have oh, Rachel Ray. They don't have Allow Rachel Ray. Allow me to say right away, they would kill Rachel <laughs> Ray. No, 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 that, no, no. But television but yes. is, is much less, uh, culinary television is much less present in France uh, than, it is, uh, than it is here. But it exists, it exists. It does oh. exist, yeah. Of course. It will often be sort of tourism will go to visit Sardinia and then we'll talk to local uh, uh, chefs there and people in the market and so forth. So it's often tied to other. Uh, but events. chefs are stars in France. I mean, now they're. But they've been yeah. stars. They've right. been stars yeah. all along, but they still point. are, absolutely. Sure. Up here, question, comment? While you're doing that, you, one thing you touch on is. They may have lost prestige, the French, but they perfected the education and training of chefs. So, I don't, you know, even today, the idea of going to France and doing a stint or a stage with, uh, with a noted French restaurant yeah. is a key part of the resume. And I think one of the things that French chefs, even if, as much as they love the rapid advancement and the money that you can make in the United States, they often lament how often how poorly trained outside of France um, the talent tends to be. They don't have the discipline and the rigor and they don't have that um, sort of programmed advancement where you go, you do all stage stations within the mm -hmm. kitchen. Um, it seems a little chaotic over here, and they just don't. If you look at somebody like Jacques Pepin, he describes it brilliantly in that book I mm. talked about. But if you just watch him um, work on an onion and reduce it to a big fat onion down to mush in, a, in about three seconds flat, you just see centuries in his hands able to calibrate the way this onion is going to go from, you know, mm. if, you go, if you ever take a knife skills course and there are these like 30 different. Uh, sizes that you reduce, you know, brunoise and all the rest of it, you watch that and you see, boy, they really did, um, they did, they perfected something that is of lasting value and always will be. You might uh, look at Marcus Samuelson's uh, memoir, Yes, Chef, and now here he is uh, growing up in Sweden, and the cuisine that he learns is essentially French haute cuisine, and he goes to Switzerland and so forth, and then he learns other cuisines by traveling around and picking up stuff, but it's not part of his training, but he has that base, uh, and he doesn't go to France for a stage for, until he'd been at Aquavit for some time, I think he took six months off or so. Um, but the basic training is very much French. We have another question. So, I was wondering what do you think about traveling chefs? Because I know that Daniel Bouloud has an outpost in, I think, China and Singapore as well. So they all do. What, what do you think of this trend? <laughs> well, it's irresistible. If, you know, in the old days, this poor fellow who was drunk over his receipts at the end of the night, this was a guy who had labored all his life and had probably started out at the busboy level and then finally achieved the ultimate dream, which is just to have your own restaurant. And the idea of having two restaurants was simply an impossibility. That wasn't what you did. I mean, even the great luminary stars, the Fernand Point uh, level of chef, which is a super genius world, towering world figure in cuisine, the idea that you would do multiples of anything would just be um, heresy because how could you have the control over the finished product um, with, which is, it's a valid question for the people that you're talking about. When you have 45 restaurants, um, whether you're Dukas or Van Gerichten, what are people getting? At the, at the same time, you know, if you're in Hong Kong, it's not that easy to come to New York to, to try this restaurant or that restaurant. So it's nice to have it come to you. Uh, but what exactly are you getting? And even, you know, even in their hometowns, how much hands-on supervision or control are these chefs exerting? This is the modern world of the chef and 
does the, who wins out on this? I mean, chefs become extremely rich, but how are the diners doing? And you know, these chefs are real entrepreneurs. That's a big, big difference from uh, from the past. Uh, Hi, good evening. Can you hear me? Yep. Oh, good. Um, I noticed when I was traveling in Europe that it was very pretty easy to find a fabulous meal in Italy for a low cost, but then in France, it was very difficult to find um, a meal that was um, also delicious, but, you know, <laughs> reasonably affordable. And even in New York, some of the best food I've eaten here was at, like, a Jean-Georges restaurant, um, but that it is also hard to find French food that is, you know, that you don't have to set a large amount of money to the side to afford. You know, may I quickly answer sure. that? There is a huge difference between French haute cuisine and Italian uh, trattoria food. Italian food is much, much more simply prepared. Mm -hmm. And that meant not having to have a very, very high-priced, very achieved chef. Uh, uh, I think the fact that in Italy, there also Italy provides a lot of the ingredients. It's the great sort of vegetable patch now uh, for the whole of, of Europe. So the ingredients are right there, very easy and... and more uh, women cooking. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, but also the, it's, it's a much easier to pr prepare um, a cuisine. It's a much simpler. Now there is a high Alta Cucina, but that's not what you're talking about. You're talking about going to a simple trattoria where the cuisine is quite easy and prepared by some young person who may not have 20 years experience. A question here first, go ahead. Hello, um, I'm wondering if anyone would be willing to talk briefly about the transition, is it still on? Yes, the transition between the cuisine bourgeois and the haute cuisine and then the nouvelle cuisine in terms of what you feel was gained and lost for the diners and in terms of the chef's relationship with the food they're preparing? Wow. <laughs> wow, that's a good question. And can you do that in five words, please? Or <laughs> that sounds like a, um, a PhD orals kind of question. <laughs> well, cuisine bourgeoise uh, goes back uh, to the, at least the early 18th century, and cuisine bourgeoise uh, was an emulation, I won't say imitation, an emulation in a modified form of haute cuisine. One, and there's one great cookbook that's 1691, and it's called uh, Royal and Bourgeois Cuisine. And you're, you're meant to uh, take haute cuisine as a model. Um, uh, and that continues sort of in cuisine bourgeoise, enriched by regional cuisines, for, uh, for example. Now, I think now, Nouvelle Cuisine has influenced both ex haute cuisine and ordinary cooking, which you can call cuisine bourgeoise, although I don't think the French would really call it uh, cuisine bourgeoise now because it's so redolent of, of a past era where it was emulating haute cuisine. So when there was a bourgeoisie. When there was, when there was a bourgeoisie of the, old, of the old style, yeah, yeah. And so I think the customers are gaining on that. I mean, um, Nouvelle Cuisine has, Nouvelle Cuisine put them all in, the, in that in the plural. I think it's a net gain. I don't want to go back to overcooked vegetables. No. I don't want to, you know. Thickened the, sauces, gloppy, you know, we don't want to. <laughs> I'd just like to add something that Ariane Batterberry said about the differences between simple, approachable, trattoria-type cuisine and haute cuisine in France. The, uh, the idea that um, a French entrepreneur or a Francophile would launch something equivalent to Italy on 23rd Street and 5th says so much about uh, the popularity and the uh, accessibility of <laughs> Italian cuisine and how it's really supplanted along with the Asia nation that you talked about, Mr. Grimes. Uh, so to, to see something like, uh, I don't even know the name, I'm not creative, but uh, 
a, a center for French culinary merchandise and raw material. Uh, it's just un inimaginable. <laughs> yeah, and why? I was actually, th this very point was brought up by the guy who owns Italy, uh, Mario Batali. I was yeah. at this lunch mm -hmm. at the Times when he was talking, and he was astonished that the French had not done this because they have the ingredients and they have the, you know, who is better than the French at presentation. Uh, yet, we have Italy and we have nothing comparable that's French, and I, I wish we did. I mean, I can think of a long list of ingredients that I'd love to be able to, to see bought over from France that I've had over there that you can't find over here, but I don't know. Where's uh, the imagination? I say, I think I do know, if I may. All right, tell us. I'll tell, because there is something called the Italian Trade Commission, and are they busy? They're terrific, and they're working round the clock, and they advertise like crazy. Um, we At Food Arts, we have 10 ads from Italian yes. products for everyone from a French product. Uh, the whole Italians are much more anxious to merchandise outside of Italy, mm. uh, I think, than the French are. Right. Hmm. And uh, that's why when you go up Madison Avenue, it's all haute couture, but it's Versace, and it's, it's all Italian, Armani, it's all Italian names uh, when you stop to notice. And the same is true with food. They, they really put a, a huge amount of money and interest in exporting and they help with exports in any way they can. And where the French export, we'll go back to Paul Bocuse, he started the Bocuse d'Or, the cooking competitions, and y you could argue that instead of exporting products, they're exporting this uh, service and technique and, and a certain service in, uh, of, an, of an ideal of what cuisine should be and not the products. And may um, I say what, one thing quickly, I was just saying, the fancy food show, if you want to go to it, it's in the summer, uh, the last one I went to, the Italian pavilion, was half the fancy food yeah. show. There were 300 booths. Mm. I mean, it just went on and on and on. It was a city, and then the French had a little area, yeah. and then anybody, yeah. there were a few other people, and it was basically the Italian food show. It was amazing. I have a question for each of you. What um, What are you working on now? And uh, okay, Priscilla, uh, I'm writing a chapter, which I hope is the last chapter of a book called um, Food Talk. And so I'm doing research even as I'm talking and listening to you all talk. Uh, uh, the explosion of food talk in the past 25 or, or so years from being sort of regulated cookbooks and so forth, and now it's. I mean, just being in New York, you're being overloaded with, uh, with, uh, with food talk, and that's some of the things I'm, I'm going to be from television to blogs to events like today. I mean, the interest in food is absolutely extraordinary. So what does that do with our sense of what we want out of a meal? Ariane? Uh, I'm the publisher of Food Arts Magazine, which is, um, I feel, the leading but <laughs> a magazine for chefs and restaurateurs and hoteliers in the United States. It's a trade publication. William. Um, well, small scale, I just, I've been eating really well because I've uh, been cooking out of 12 cookbooks that I'm reviewing for the holiday, you know, the book review does a holiday roundup, so I did the cookbooks this year, and as a matter of painful duty, I <laughs> made things from a dozen cookbooks that I write about. So that's been my immediate task. Are you working on another book? I am working on a book. I'm editing a, uh, a book that the Times is doing about the 1980s, and it's the decade as seen through the coverage in the newspaper. So it's all little departments of life, ranging from uh, you know pop music to space exploration to the decline, of, the decline and fall of the Eastern Bloc. It was an exciting decade when you think back on it. And I'm old enough to remember it, so. <laughs> Are you sure you're just two years old at that time, too? Is that correct? <laughs> uh, I want to thank our three speakers. They were wonderful. Can, can and you thank you all for coming out on this yeah. dreadful yes, thank night. you all. Yes, you braved the weather. Can yes. you stay for a few minutes, or are you uh, headed off quickly? Sure.
Okay, if any of you wish to talk with them privately, come on up. Uh, for my students, I need to see you in the back, all right? Ah.